Good morning, good morning, church. As you all find your seats, uh, remain standing and we'll seek the Lord in prayer. Amen. We serve a good God. Amen. Father God, we invite you into this place and we just want to open our hearts, lift up our hands, lift up our voices to our thrice holy God. We love you so much and we just want to pour out to you, Father, and we want to hear from you this morning as well as we draw near to you through worship and we hear from your word. May it just build us up, Father God. We love you so much and we just dedicate this time to you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's worship.
is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Amen. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? the enemy underneath my feet you are my sword and shield though troubles linger still whom shall I fear I know who goes before me I know who stands behind the God of angel armies is always by my side the one who reigns forever he is a friend of mine the god of angel armies is always by my side my strength is in your name for you alone can you will deliver me Yours is the victory Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me I know who stands behind The God of angels salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved amen thank you jesus as morning dawns and evening fades from earth to 
touch your heart and glorify your name your name is a strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter lying the world your name let the nation sing it louder there's nothing has the power to save but your name.
take all I have in these hands and multiply God all that I am and find my heart on the altar again set me on fire set me on fire take all I have in these hands and multiply God all that I am and find my heart on the altar again set me on fire set me on fire here I am God arms wide open pouring out my life gracefully broken my heart stands far of your name your mighty love stands strong to the end you will fulfill your purpose for me you won't forsake me you will be with me here I am God arms wide silence for God only 
from him is my salvation. Amen. You stood before creation.
What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely. So what can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely. that are raised, Lord, to go about and do all kinds of things, Father, to further your kingdom, your gospel, your truths, Father. Please bless the offering, Father. Lord, please bless the children as they go to their Sunday school, Lord. May they know you, Father. May they learn about you and, and at a young age, Father, start knowing who you are and walking with you, Lord. And, Father, we lift up the message today, Father, that you would please, um, that you would please speak to our hearts, Father, that you would tear down any Satan would have in us, Father, that you rebuild us, Lord, with your word and the message today. May we be in agreement with what uh, Brother Joe is going to put forth by your spirit, Father. Father, we thank you and we praise you. And, um... Father, you said when we pray, to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Please forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and deliver us from temptation. Thank you, Father. And we pray, Jesus. Amen. If you'd all be seated for just a moment, we're going to release everybody and greet in a minute. So we're going to do announcements right now. So you'd have a seat for just a moment. We'll release the kids in about just after announcements. So please have a seat. Um, welcome, everybody. If you're new here to Blessed Hope, we'd like to get to know you. Uh, if you haven't filled out a visitor's card, please do so. It's good to see you all. Um, first up on the announcements is we have our family church uh, camp coming up uh, at Lake Casitas. That's September 27th through the 29th. And very important that we all know there be no church on Sunday. Yes. Yeah, well, we're working on it. So there'll be no service on that Sunday uh, of the family camp. Uh, next up, we have got the uh, women's retreat coming up October 26th. Um, please, ladies, be prepared for that. It's a beautiful thing. And then the junior youth group will meet uh, Tuesday, September 8th. Now, all of you need to know that uh, we have a certain birthday coming up this Tuesday the 19th and the initials of that person are JS and that would be aka your pastor Joe his birthday is Tuesday um, a request from Jonathan 
down in Mexico is that we would bring clothes. And um, I guess there's a big need for clothes down in Mexico. So please, if you have any extra clothes you want to get rid of, please bring them to church. We'll, we'll put them together. Uh, there's a big group of people going down on the 20th, um, which is uh, just next week, I believe. Yeah, next week. So if you bring clothes in, maybe this Wednesday, uh, it'd have to be Wednesday because they're leaving on Friday, I believe. But there's a big need for clothes down in Mexico, so any additional clothes you have, you can get them here this week would be great. And um, there's a need down there. Jonathan said there's an absolute need for uh, clothing down in Mexico. Um, also, uh, we are in immediate need of a teacher, uh, teachers for the uh, third through fifth grade class. Uh, you'd start in October, and you teach just once every five weeks. Okay, so it's not, uh, it's not a huge demand, okay? Um, you only need to know your lesson since all the prep work is done ahead for you. So you get a lesson, you read it, and you teach it the next day. It's, um, you can do it. If you have a heart, you can do it. Just uh, step up, we do need somebody. So please, uh, we really do need someone, so please step up somebody. And uh, ask for Star. Um, Starlet, and uh, she was the one handling that. Um, let's see, um, the Tithely app, please, if you don't have it, I know I keep talking about it, but please get the Tithely app. It's going to have all of our scheduling on it. It's going to have push notifications. Like, for example, we don't have church on the family camp. There'll be a push notification saying, hey, no church Sunday. So if you're out of town or you didn't know, you would be informed through that app. To mention all the schedulings on there and all the things that are coming up so please get that tithely app you guys very helpful and um, all right so as you guys can see we have a little new format today we're trying to not have a bit a bunch of downtime for the live stream so this is kind of a new we're gonna try this format um, this week and next week see how it goes and um, we don't want to cut out and greeting everybody so what we're gonna do is now will be the time to uh, go ahead and let your kids go to class and um, go and greet your neighbor next to you. And uh, you have about a minute to do that. And then Pastor Joe's going to come up and give his message. So at this time, you're going to release your kids to class and go ahead and say hi to uh, your neighbor next to you. All right. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. Yeah, so there's going to be some adjustment. Uh, when Johnny, uh, who was going to have you sit down, everybody's used to breaking. It's nobody's fault. So everybody's kind of chatting and hanging. After doing it for, what, 28 years, you kind of be able to have it, you know? But anyway, we'll get it down. Uh, still have a little greeting time. But uh, I'm like, man, they're all greeted out. They're all sitting down now. What's up with that, you know? Good to see everybody. Uh, let's seek our Father in prayer. Father God, we agree with what's been praised, Father, which, what's been prayed. Uh, 
as John uh, led us in prayer and as uh, Tony, the worship team, led us in, in prayer and praise, we just pray again, Father. We, we thank you that we can get together on the first day of the week, Father. And Father, your son said uh, his temple was to be a house of prayer, Father. And we are at the temple of the Holy Spirit, Father. May we pray without ceasing, Father. And Father, as we continue to seek your face, may we pray and hear your word from you, Father, for we cry out to you, Father, not to get you to do our will, but to help us better align ourselves with your will, Father. And we pray that you speak to us through your word by your spirit. And we pray, Father, that we grow spiritually, that we'd be strengthened, Father, we'd be all that you've called us to be. We pray, Father, that you would heal those who are sick amongst us, Lord that you would uh, strengthen those who are weak, Father, those who are going through trials, that you would be the strength of their lives, that you'd help each and every one of us to conquer sin, to be overcomers by the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, Father, by the word of our testimony, and by not loving our lives unto death, as Revelation 12, 11 says. We pray, Father, that you'd be glorified in our study through your word as we go through Ecclesiastes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Praise God, everybody. Please take your Bibles and go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Now it's interesting. Uh, We've been in this passage. I mentioned that I'm going to do some child training messages in this, you know, while we're going through chapter 9 a little bit. I think I'll probably wait until the end of the chapter because we've been just getting back in Ecclesiastes and I didn't want to just launch into a few studies that are related to some of the texts. Actually, a couple different verses I was really thinking, you know, I need to address some of the, uh, I mean, it's something that's needed. You know, I've done messages or whole series called the principles of parenting and so forth through the years that are still available to you if you're child training it's a lot of bible and what god says i encourage you to get that the whole series uh, i did that um, i don't know eight or ten messages i don't know how many but uh we'll do a few other messages on parenting coming up pretty soon here uh on wednesdays we're going through the book of revelation typically but i'm doing a two-part series we've already done part one part two is on a God hates divorce. So I'd encourage you uh, to grab last Wednesday's message, and I'll be doing another one this Wednesday. And uh, it was going to be one message, but I barely got into my notes, and we got into a whole lot of stuff before. I mean, we got into the Word still, but it's going to get stronger and stronger. So I encourage you. uh, I guess we're kind of like a little family theme here. I didn't really intend on, you know, talking about divorce and and, uh, parenting. And then this message, the verses, I'm like, wow, Lord, message on divorce, Marriages on parenting coming up, and then the text before us has to do with, uh, well, there's a little gem in there about, you know, husbands loving their wives. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to camp out there because this is so needed in this day and age, amen? Because we live in a time in, in, in our human history where it says it would become like the days of Lot. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? And Jesus said like the days of Noah, where wicked, wickedness was, you know, pervasive over the earth. The days of Lot, there was a family breakdown homosexuality ran rampant. And Paul said, you know, in the last days, you know, terrible times would come and men would be lovers of self. And he said they'd be without family love. Literally. The Greek words is, the Greek words are story, and story, the word story is family love, and s story, or a story, uh, is without, without family love. And that's where we're at in our day and age where People are so into themselves and projecting themselves and who they are and social media defines you as, you know, an independent person and, and family has been uh, just redefined in our age and a love for husband and wife relationships, a love for husband and wife relationships and their love for their children is almost an anomaly. I mean, the whole father knows best, leave it to beaver kind of setting is like in the dust right now, but it's not from God's standpoint, amen? So I want to talk about these things a little bit today as far as not fa- uh, parental, you know, ch- training children. We're going to have a, a few messages on that. But this is, I want you to look at verse 7. Keep in mind, so I don't have to read the first six verses of chapter 9, but in the first six verses of chapter 9, if you haven't, weren't with us last week, go ahead and check that out. Uh, in the run-up to that, it basically tells us that tragedy and death affect everybody. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, who you are, that we don't control what comes around the bend. You know, God's ultimately in control. Uh, There's his direct, decreed will. Uh, There's also his permissive will. He allows certain things, but he doesn't allow us to go through more than we are able, and we're supposed to put our trust in him, that he loves us, and he works everything for the good, for those who love him or call according to his purpose. Amen. But it's a a very uh, dark passage as far as the underbelly of the result of the fall of man. And it says in the text, because people are evil. We live in a fallen world. It's not God's fault. 
Uh, God didn't make us robots, and we rebelled. But he has a plan of redemption because he's a good God, and he's a powerful God, and he's a caring God. Amen? But so the first verses in chapter 10 underscore the human tragedy, uh, the fall, and the, fa- uh, you know, the wickedness in that fall. And the repercussions of that are death, and that we all die. And you can't really curtail that reality. And it talks about blessings as well. In the verses that we have before us in chapter 9, verse 7, in light of verses 1 through 6, the first word he uses in verse 7 is go. In other words, don't become debilitated looking at the, that there's tragedy around the band and we must brace ourselves in the Lord for it, but go in the Lord and enjoy the blessings because he goes on to talk about the blessings that we have in Christ, the blessings that we have in the Lord. And so it's important that we have this understanding that uh, you can't forestall death and he talks about that in verses 1 through 6, but there's also blessings. J.C. Ryle, he was a great, uh, uh, you know, Anglican leader, uh, wrote a lot of really wonderful things in the past. He wrote, quote, death is the mighty leveler. He spares no one. He will tarry, uh, he will not tarry for, uh, till you are ready. He will not be kept by moats. He will not be kept out by moats, doors, bars, or bolts. In God's appointed hour, death will come. It's just a reality, you know? It's a reality. Uh, There was a horror movie out that came out, I think, you know, this year sometime. I remember seeing that it was out, and it was on uh, the Winchester's family, you know, the Winchester house. Anybody see the trailer for that or see that 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 movie was coming up? A few of you. Uh, San Jose, it's not far from us. It's It's an attraction of sorts out there now. Because Sarah Winchester, her husband invented the, invented the Winchester, you know, rifle, which uh, is very prolific. Uh, and so a lot of rifles. They had a ton of money, can you imagine? And he died of influenza in 1918. And his wife uh, had a ton of money, but she didn't want to die. And she was into uh, the occult, into the mediumship, spiritism, and contacting mediums and so forth that, you know, we're in touch with the spirit world, which the Bible warns against. The Bible warns is demonic, will lead you astray. Jesus said, thy word is truth, amen? And she got in touch with the medium, and the medium told her that she would never die physically. She'd just continue living. Sarah Winchester, wife of the famed Winchester rifle man, uh, you'll never die as long as you continue to build your home. Well, she had moved to San Jose after getting that revelation and bought a 17-room mansion. And she began to build with all the riches her husband had won through developing. And before she was done, she had 150 rooms. No kidding. 47 fireplaces. Yeah, right? Who needs all those fireplaces, right? especially in California, right? You know? I and mean, I rented a home before with fireplace more than once, and I love fireplace, but 47? Uh, 2,000 uh, windows, you know? I mean, come on. I mean, you know, just out, absolutely uh, outraged. I'm sorry. Uh, 2,000 doors, okay? 2,000 doors, 10,000 windows, okay? It's a lot of windows, what a pain to fix all those, right? Uh, but I'm sorry, it's kind of weak. But, uh, but horrible situation. I mean, think about it. She continued to build and build and build. She spent $5 million. Now, back in those days, that's when people, laborers working in her house earned 50 cents a day. Okay? And when, she, guess what? Do you think she stayed alive? She never finished. Was the medium that prophesied that this demon that worked through her or what have you that you'll continue to live as long as you build do you think that came to pass no she died at the age of 85 and that's not a shock because the bible warns that satan lies about death genesis chapter 3 one of his first lies thou shalt surely not die and the bible says the soul that sins will die the wage of sin is death it's when a man wants to die, but after this, the judgment, amen? A lot of scriptures talk about that. And sure enough, she died at the age of 85. She's not around now. The house is there, 
By the way, she had enough materials there to continue to work on that house for 80 years when she died. Okay? But she fell under this delusion, this deception, because people have the fear of death. They really don't want to die deep down. They might act all brave and everything without Christ, but there's an inner witness that something's not right unless you totally delude yourself with drugs and, you know, deception. So, what a tragedy. So at the end of verse, uh, at chapter 10, I'm sorry, chapter 9, verse 6, we read, you know, at the very end of what we read last week when we ended in verse 6, indeed their love, there's hate, and, and their zeal have already perished, and they will no longer have a share in all that is done under the sun. So once you're dead, you, there's nothing you can do here. You have no inheritance on this earth. From a heavenly viewpoint, if you know the Lord, you have an eternal inheritance. But then he says in verse 7, which is where we pick it up, go. He says, go then, eat your bread in happiness. Meaning, yeah, there's tragedy in this world. I love the realism of the Bible. It's just God's word, man. Boom, right to us. And he says, go then and eat your bread in happiness. And drink your wine with a cheerful heart. For God has already approved your works. Wow. I love that. So eat your bread in happiness and, and drink your wine with a cheerful heart. For God has already approved your works. God has supplied our needs, the Bible says, according to our riches and glory. And along with the burdens, there are blessings. Look at verse 9. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your uh, fleeting life, which he has given to you under the sun. If you're married, enjoy the woman that God has given you. For this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. Now it's interesting because he meets our needs according to his riches and glory. He gives us food. He gives us drink. Uh, Ecclesiastes 2.24. Some commentators treat this as though Solomon's dropping back into the funk of when he fell away from the Lord. And that's how he's talking now. He's not. Okay? He's, God's not a killjoy. He wants us to enjoy uh, our food and our drink. He doesn't want you to be a glutton. He doesn't want you to get drunk. And uh, obviously wine there, the, the, the Hebrew word often referred to the new wine that wouldn't get you drunk or they'd mix their water with wine. But it forbids drunkenness. But uh, whatever, that, whatever may be the case there, obviously he wants you to have a healthy, blessed life. And he wants you to be blessed in, in this life. In fact, I love a lot of these scriptures like Ecclesiastes 2, 24. Let's just back up. We already studied this, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but look at verse 24. There is nothing better for a man than to what? Eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen that it is from what? Chapter 2, verse 24. It's from what? The hand of God. The hand of God. So this isn't part of him going back into his funk. Now, sometimes he'll tell you where he was at when he was lost, but then he reorientates us from, from the view that's not just under the sun, but a view that's heavenward and from heaven's eyes and from God's eyes and God's word. And God wants to bless us. In fact, I love one of my favorite verses in the book of Acts is Acts 14, 17. It says, and yet he did not leave himself without witness. That's what, I love this whole verse, but that's the part that sticks out. God's a witness everywhere. There's nobody's going to ever be able to say, well, I never knew about God. Romans chapter 1, it says he's made himself clear through the things he's made, even his divine attributes, right? His eternal power, and people are without excuse who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven again against all unrighteous men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And he's not left himself without a witness. He has the witness of the starry sky above us that only God can make. Amen. Uh, the earth we walk on and the, and the moral code in our hearts that we, it bears witness that there is morality. There's a, there's a law of right and wrong. Uh, if there's a lawgiver, obviously, then if there's a moral law in our hearts. And yet he did not leave himself without witness and that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with what? Food and gladness, amen? I love, I love this verse too because I love food and I love to be joyful. I love gladness. Amen. And God's blessed with food. He's given us thousands, four to 5,000 or so. I've read different 3,000, four, 5,000 taste buds. Amen. Do you ever thank the Lord for taste buds? I made my mom's famous peanut butter cookies a week and a half ago. 
two weeks ago, and I've only made them once. And that's probably, I made them twice because I made them twice that day because my son Josiah came home and he's gluten-free. So I had to make homemade again a gluten-free batch for him. I didn't have to, but I wanted to. And they just did not taste like her cookies, you know? I lost around 30 pounds or so through the last year. I thought, you know, I'm exercising pretty steady. I go, I'll have some peanut butter cookies, you know? I've missed those so much. Hey, Mom, right on cue, you know? Wow. <laughs> she heard her name, and she bolted from the nursery, making sure I'm not saying anything bad about her. You know, never do, never have. Uh, <laughs> it's easy, easy not to say something bad about you because you're amazing. But uh, and it wasn't the same. I called her up and asked her, because I think she was using all butter instead of butter and half Crisco or whatever. I don't know. It's a long story. But you know what? They just didn't taste the same. And I thought, I talked to her and made him how she made him. It's just, you're holding out on me somewhere, I know, with those cookies, because it's like way off. But I thought my taste buds are getting older, I think. It's, I think your taste buds change. Remember certain things you ate when you were a kid? It's like, wow. In some places, they just change the ingredients, you know, certain candy bars or what have you. But uh, praise God for your taste buds. You know, there's three things I, I say you should always bring to the table, okay? Salt, unless you have high blood pressure. Don't take my medical advice, okay? That's not for you if you have high blood pressure or have some kind of problem with salt. Uh, or, and number two, he says in verse, look at what he says in, uh, I love this. Chapter nine, uh, verse nine, enjoy life with the women whom you love in all the days of your, uh, your fleeting life, which he has given you under the sun. So you need salt, but you need to enjoy life. But it says with the woman you love. You can't enjoy life if you don't walk in love. It's a given fact. It's a reality. So when you go to the table and you have a wife, or you don't have a wife, whoever you're fellowshipping with, if it's just you and the Lord, that can be the sweetest fellowship. Throughout my Christian walk, even since I've been married, the sweetest fellowship I often experience, and I experience some very beautiful fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, family, is with the Lord, you know? Just spending time with Him in prayer, seeking Him, you know? And I hear people complain when they can't sleep, and I understand, but when I can't sleep, I turn that time of, uh, where you can't sleep into time of praise, and I just worship and cry out to Him and seek Him and draw near to Him, and I know He, 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 he is uh, true to His word. He draws near to those who draw near to Him, amen? It's a great time to just get close to the Lord, especially if you're busy like me and you have crazy busy days, you know? Like, okay, Lord, you know? And my wife, I got to bed at 3 a.m. and I had to get up early this morning and I woke up feeling great. I've been a little under weather. You know that cold everybody caught early in the year and the flu and everything? I always tell people, I either don't get it or I get it later. And is Mr. Voss here? He's gonna probably be listening to this by CD later. Uh, but a few of these guys had a Joe Pure, I think, but not as bad as Mr. Voss. Right, but just the cold and everything. Just in the middle of summer. And I'm like, man, I haven't had anything yet. I tried to say, give those guys hugs, but kind of in a discerning way, you know? That's why I haven't hugged people today, because I got this little, uh, I'm going. But it's kind of debilitated me a little bit. But the Lord just rose me up after a few hours sleep, boom, wide awake, ready to, I stayed up till three because I didn't know how much energy I'd have in the morning. So I just finished my message almost until 3 a.m., went to bed, and I woke up with a lot of energy. And... I don't know how I'll be after this message, uh, but my point is this, is that no matter what you're going through, you can seek the Lord, amen? And when you're at your dinner table, don't be a whiner. Don't be a complainer. Don't be a bitter person. Be a lover, man. Choose to love. It's a choice. And you know what? Choose to be grateful. It says, you know, enjoy life, right? Right? With the wife you love. You, if your love's not there, you're going to have a hard time enjoying. But you choose to love, amen? It's a choice we make. And you choose to rejoice. How do I know? Because the Bible commands us to rejoice over and over again. How can you just obey a command to rejoice? Because you know what? Sometimes we get our minds focused on things that cause us not to rejoice. And we become discontented and we get our eyes off of the Lord and what he's doing in our lives and what he wants to do in our lives, Amen. But the Bible says rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. And Paul writes that from a, a prison, a Roman prison, to the, to the, Philipp uh, the Philippians. I almost said to the Filipinos because we've done some mission trips to the Philippines. But to the Philippians, he tells them to rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. And he mentions rejoicing more in that letter, in those four short chapters, than, his, all, than all his other letters. 
It's amazing. Because I know when I sit down or whatever I'm doing throughout the day, I'm happy to be alive. And it could be your worst day. And come on, your worst day, sometimes you have a lot of tears. You can have pain and sadness. But it says, weeping yet rejoicing. There's a ver verse that says that. In other words, even in your deepest, darkest day, you can find the Lord's rainbow. You can find his silver linings. You can trust what he says about he works all things together for the good, for those who love him and are the call according to his purpose. Amen? You can say, well, what if I don't feel I love him at that moment? Then choose to love him. That's a choice. You choose to love God. Amen? The Bible says, curses everyone who does not love the Lord, 1 Corinthians 16. But if you love the Lord, he works everything out for the good for you. You choose to, I'm going to love you and trust you no matter what because you created the entire universe. Any sense of what for, about right and wrong comes from you. And you're perfect, so I've got it messed up if I don't see something straight. And you choose to love him on your worst day. And you choose to rejoice and be thankful for your food. Amen? Thankful that you're alive and you have another breath to take. Thankful that you're not in hell, which you and I deserve. And your worst day on earth, I've said it several times, your worst day on earth is better than your best day in hell that you deserve. And we're not going there because of Jesus. And God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes him should not perish but have her last life. He was slaughtered on the cross to keep you out of there. Happy is the one whose sins are not imputed to them, the Bible says. You know? Let the, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And guess what? At dinner, man, thank him for your redemption. Thank him for your, 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 your bread. Thank him for meeting your needs. There's so much to be thankful for. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Colossians 3, 17 says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So you're supposed to be, whatever you do, eat, drink, word, deed, be giving thanks, amen? And when you start to focus on what you deserve and you're not getting because of what he went through for you and what you're getting that you don't deserve, his grace and mercy, you start to become a joyful, thankful person. Do you understand that? It's not about like these self-help books trying to whip yourself up into, into having a positive attitude. That stuff's all bankrupt because there's no basis in humanism to have joy. Because guess what? If you just have humanism and you put God out and you put a relationship with God out and God's plan of redemption out and God's word out and it's just you and trying to be positive, really there's nothing to be positive about. You're going back to the dirt, man. You're going to be eaten by worms. You know what I'm saying? And, and you can try to con yourself into, you know, but, and then the fear of death will hover over you and you can try to have all kinds of self-speak circumstantially, but eventually your circumstances are going to change. Your hope has to be fixed in Jesus, amen? So I encourage you, man, bring the salt if you don't have high blood pressure. You don't have problems. But also bring the love and the joy Verse 8 says, let, and I'll get back to verse 9 in a second. Let your clothes be white all the time, and let not oil be lacking on your head. Now he's writing at a time where it's in a culture where oil is very important. There's not a lot of medicinal things going on. Oil is even proven today. A lot of people, how many take different oils for medicinal reasons, you know, right? Uh, but in those days, I mean, it was a lot like California. When you go to Israel, if you're going on the Israel trip, I think we have like 50 people, and that it was supposed to be a limit of 50, and now more and more people have been wanting to get in, but it, my wife's like shaking her head right now, and she feel, we feel bad, but Ted asked us to keep it down to 50, and we're not used to, you don't usually have that problem, you know? Usually, you know, we got 30 or something, but we have 50 this time, which is great. There's a lot of neat growth going on. It's exciting, but uh, it's very arid, like the area that we live in, dry at times hot at certain times of the year. Uh, it's like California in a lot of ways because you only have like a lot of rolling hills, but you also have a lot of forest and vegetation in northern parts of Israel. Even outside of Jerusalem in the south, there's teeming huge forests. It's beautiful. But uh, oil was very important. But having oil on your face and dressing in white was not something the average farmer would do, right? Or peasant or person working. What's he saying then? He's saying... Because dressing in white, it's not purple, it's not like lavish living. And oil, oil and dressing in white was a time of festivity, uh, like for weddings and what have you. And he's basically saying approach life and be thankful and celebrate. 
I love that. That's a really cool verse. In other words, we live in this tragic, especially with verses one through six in the backdrop. I mean, you read verses one through six are some of the heaviest verses for the, the, the human condition as a result of the fall you read in the Bible. It's very, they're profoundly dark as far as describing our, says, whoa, man, look at 789 though. And he's like, hey, for those who know the Lord and recognize that these things come from the hand of God, he's saying in the midst of a dismal, dark, ugly world, rejoice. First Timothy chapter six, verse 17 says, charge those who are rich in this world to share with others. And then he goes on to say, and to remind us that God has given us all things to what? enjoy we have a good god amen and in some christian traditions you get two extremes you know you get the extreme where it's like the health and wealth gospel and there's no warnings and 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 it's all about you know getting rich and you're a king's kid and god wants everybody rich and and that's a false gospel you know and then there's the other extreme that god always wants christians to hang their head and be you know dour and 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 kind of pruned faced and walk around like it's like what in the world we're the ones that have the hope amen he is risen amen because i live just as you will live also he rose from the grave amen our names rejoice because your names are written in the book of life amen jesus says don't rejoice that you have power of demons but rejoice that your names are written in heaven is how he put it in luke chapter 10 we should be rejoicing and the world should be tripping out like how don't you see what's going around in the world how can you be so happy because I see what's happening under the sun, but I see what's happening over the sun too. And my name is written in heaven. And give them hope and share the love of Christ with them. And people are impoverished. They don't have the truth. They don't have Jesus. They're, they're, they're spiritually dead. And we have the answers and we're supposed to be living epistles, witnesses that people read, amen? And we need to do that. We need to, to be a light, you know, an encouragement. And this, Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal kill and destroy but i have come that you might have life and that you might have it what more abundantly he wants us to have abundant life and that abundant life doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have a big home or you'll marry somebody named winchester or whatever you can have nothing and be content in jesus paul said be content with food and covering amen you came into the world naked you're going to leave it naked but I love it because Paul's able to rejoice in prison because he's in God's will. And he's praising God for the furtherance of the gospel. He says, even what happened to me, me being in this, this Roman prison has happened for the furtherance of the gospel. He sees, even though everybody else said, poor Paul, he's serving Jesus. Look where that got him. I'm sure people thought that. How, uh, you know, John the Baptist, remember when he was in prison? What am I doing here? It even happened to him. Jesus said, hey, warned him, hey, you know, the people are being healed. These are, the prophecy are fulfilled, basically, what Jesus is saying. He says, blessed is the one who does not fall away because of me. Paul and John the Baptist were in similar circumstances, imprisoned, both for serving God. John the Baptist got his eyes off of God's bigger plan, and a lot of the Jews up to that point didn't understand how much suffering played a role in God's redemptive plan, you know? And in, in Paul's day, he understood, Jesus said when he first converted, got converted in the book of Acts, he, Jesus said to him, Paul said, he showed me how much I must suffer for his name. So genuine believers can suffer. And Paul even had a thorn in the flesh. And he prayed three times the Lord would take it. The Lord didn't take it. But you know what? Paul rejoiced. He said he rejoiced in his weaknesses. Because when he's weak, he knew he was strong. And that God allowed him to have a thorn in the flesh. So he wouldn't fall away. So he said he wouldn't be lifted up in pride because of all the visions he was having. We have to allow God to be God in our lives, amen? There's some things that are self-inflicted, pains, right? Those are things you don't want to do. I mean, most of the pain we go through, oftentimes, I should say, as humans, is as a result of self-inflicted pain. Not always, but often. But God brings the... Per but if you just let God be God and you obey him, we're still part of that fallen human system right because of sin so it's all a result ultimately of our sin as far as evil and what have you but god brings a balance so often i don't know how he does it he's god i don't have to know how he does it of of blessings and there's burdens amen we all experience blessings and burdens we experience blessings so we can have joy thank you jesus amen but we also experience burdens we need burdens you know why because Paul said if he didn't have the thorn in the flesh, he'd be lifted up in pride. Pride comes, he wrote, before fall. Amen? 
So God allows the burdens in our lives to keep us humble, amen? Because God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud, amen? So God allows burdens in our lives to keep us humble. So when you see burdens come, don't be like, all depressed and say, you know what, Lord? You've called me to be an overcomer, you know? Not under the circumstances, but an overcomer, amen? And I'm not gonna be under the circumstances because I'm not gonna be under the sun. I'm gonna see through your eyes, through heavenly eyes, and I'm gonna be walking over the circumstances, being an overcomer in Jesus. Are you with me today? All this stuff's so important for our walks with Jesus. That we, that we put one foot in front of the other in Jesus and whatever burdens come, we say, you know what, Lord, you knew I'd be here. I give it to you. I cast my burdens. I cast my cares. I cast my anxieties to you because you care for me. And I know whatever I'm going to go through, you care for me through this moment and you love me. And guess what's happening at that moment? You're humbling yourself and you're crying out to God. Do you catch that? And you didn't even know we were making that transition. It's just we go through burdens, we cry out to God. If we're believers, if we're trusting Jesus, if we're wise, we cry out to him. And guess what? That's what humble people do. They recognize that we're not sufficient in of ourselves and we got to cry out to God. Amen? We cry out to God for the most important thing, our eternal salvation. We cry out to him through our daily circumstances. And burdens become a blessing in the end. Amen? So I see personally, I see blessings and blessings. Because I see blessings are blessings, and I, say bur- I see burdens, when we properly respond to them, become blessings. Amen? Amen? And that's the heart God wants us to have. Now, uh, verse 9. Enjoy life. We've been talking about that. Hey, we have a church camping trip coming up. How far is that away? That's like just next weekend, right? We have a great time. You can enjoy life there. Succulent tri-tip, you know. Uh, Camping under the stars. Praise and worship music, amen. Loving one another, growing in grace. Some of you are thinking, mosquitoes. We don't have mosquitoes like the South. Come on, they're like birds over there. You know, big birds, some of them. That's a state bird of some states over there, the mosquito, you know. Uh, and if you can't make it the whole weekend, drive down for Saturday or something, or Sunday service. There's no service here uh, Sunday, so don't show up. Uh, if you're going to stay in town, uh, I'm sorry? Thursday through Saturday? Service is Saturday. No, yeah, we still have service up there, though. That's how we've been doing it the last several years. You scared me. I'm like, where am I supposed to be? Yeah, so we've been doing service at, uh, at the camp on Saturday nights, so please show up there. Yes, thank you. Remind, the, remind everybody. So, and just come up for the day and have service in the evening or we have a great time but if you can make it overnight we have such a blessed time because how many Sundays do you have to get together before you spend that many times of hours in fellowship with people a lot so you get a lot of good fellowship it strengthens your walk just want to encourage you in that and you enjoy life but it says in verse 9 enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life which he has given you under the sun For this is your reward in life and your toil in which you have labored under the sun. God gives us reward. He gives us blessing, you know. And of course, not everybody is married, you know. But, uh, and Paul would argue that you're better off not being married, you know. And uh, you'll have trouble in the flesh, he says, and what have you. So there's also a great reward in being single. I mean, how did that work? Great. Look at the Apostle Paul most fruitful man other than Jesus probably on the earth. And look at Jesus, amen? He wasn't married to Mary Magdalene. There's nothing in scripture or early church history that even hints at that. And uh, those are two of the most radical people alive ever. Of course, Jesus is God in the flesh. So, uh, but God wants to bless you. And Paul, when he says you're better off single unless you don't have the gift of singleness, he's talking about because you could be diverted and, you know, and divided in, in your service to the Lord. Not that you're not serving the Lord, but you, the husband must please the wife, the must, wife must please the husband, and what have you. gets into that. Uh, but I wanted to talk about a little bit uh, this morning about Ten Commandments. Not the Ten Commandments, but I want to talk about the Ten Commandments for couples. That's the name of this message, Ten Commandments for Couples. Because here, he indicates that you can enjoy life because you what? Love your what? 
love your wife. Now, it's directed at the man, but I wanted to deal, and I have a confession to make. My whole, I had 10 commandments for men only because it's directed to the men. But I thought, Lord, I have enough time to squeeze the women in there. And I thought, I'm going to have a lot of men upset with me. I know if I had 10 commandments for the women, but not for the men, how would you women feel? Come on, let's be honest. Wait, we got, come on. Talk to my husband too now. Amen. But, but I'm of the opinion that if you obey the Ten Commandments that are given for men toward your wives, your wife's going to want to do the Lord's will. In most cases anyway, amen? If she's a godly woman, that's for sure. So anyway, I want to talk about uh, Ten Commandments. Uh, first, I'm going to start, though, with wives. And by the way, you're like, well, we're not under the Ten Commandments. Well, nine of the Ten Commandments are part of the law of Christ in the New Testament, amen? Everything but the Sabbath is repeated. We're, under, we're not under the law of Moses. We're not under the Mosaic law. We're under the law of Christ, the Scriptures say. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Both reference uh, the law of Christ. Uh, so I wrote down last night and this morning as well and other thoughts I'd had working up to this message, uh, different parts of this message, different times, but I really concentrated lately on the Ten Commandments for wives and the Ten Commandments for husbands. So really, you got 20 commandments here, 10. There's a couple that overlap, but most of them don't. Uh, and the first commandment uh, for the wife is, and this is, all in the, this is all under the law of Christ. All of this is, for the most part, in the New Testament. Or if it's from the Old Testament, something that's repeated or reflected in the New Testament and has uh, doctrinal value for us today. Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 24. The command, first commandment is, submit to your husband's headship in the relationship. Recognize that God's given a male leadership. It's not popular today because we live in a world that's all backwards and that doesn't want to believe there's any real uh, God, you know, that the family is instituted and marriage is instituted by God because of Darwinism and all this ugly stuff that's around right now. But we read in Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, Let's, let's go there real quick. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 24. This is the first of the Ten Commandments for women. Uh, Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. We read this. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. And this has been chipped away at for years and years. I remember when I was a little kid. I shouldn't say a little kid. I was like, couldn't have been a little kid because I was a new Christian and I was like maybe 18, 19 years old. But a young guy, young believer, he became a believer when I was turning 18 right around there. And Phil Donahue he was the Oprah Winfrey of the day back in those days. Anybody remember Phil Donahue? Oh, wow, all these hands go up. Wow. You know, it was like Dr. Phil kind of guy back then, but far more political. And he was, you know, there was a liberal streak down the middle of his back. He was just totally pushing a liberal agenda. And there was a professing Christian leader on his show, and he said, you believe that wives should be submissive to their husbands? And he, made, he tried to mock him in front of the crowd, and now... America was far more conservative then, you know? uh, but even then, but his crowd's pretty liberal. A lot of undiscerning people for the most part. Of course, they like Phil Donahue's pro-killing babies and everything else, you know, under the liberal sun. And he's like, yeah, I do. And he goes, but he, he turned the question around. He said, hey, there's a leader of a country, a president. If there's a leader of a state, a governor. There's a leader of a city, a mayor. And he said, and... and he said, and Phil, who's the leader of the Phil Donahue show? Caught him in the headlights. Um, um, in other words, God, you know, even the world recognizes leadership is important, amen? And God's, uh, uh, but now we understand from a Christian perspective that when you look at the Christian paradigm and the way God set it up, it was a blow mine. Because uh, when you have husbands being commanded, and we'll get to that in a moment, to love their wives as Christ loved the church, that was unheard of in Hellenistic culture, to treat your wives like that. It was a blow mind. Uh, and I'll get into that in a minute. But So God created a relationship that blew everybody away because it showed the harmony that God had desired. And it was beautiful. And there is 
headship. Now, of course, if a husband tells a wife to do something that's evil, right, or wrong, is she supposed to obey him? No, we're called to obey the laws of the land too and obey the civil authorities, Romans 13 and other passages. But if we're told to worship a false god or that we can't worship Jesus or we can't gather together to get, as believers or we have to take the mark of the beast, are we to do those things if the state tells us to do that? Absolutely not, amen? So if a husband tells his wife to do something like take drugs, you know, or to uh, steal money or to do something evil, Jesus is your first loyalty by far, amen? It's not even a contest. You don't even think about it. You're like, no. If it's clear what the scriptures say, your husband tells you to do something different, you have to obey the Lord, amen? So husbands, it's important that you're in the word and you're in prayer, amen? And then sisters, I don't have time to get into it, but even when Abraham went off, because if you continue reading to verse 6 of 1 Peter 3, which uh, 1 Peter 3 says this, verses 1 and 2, in the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Uh, a few verses later, verse 6, it talks about how Sarah submitted to Abraham's leadership and called him Lord even. But if you think about it, is when Abraham was off a bit and she still followed his leadership, not doing something that was contrary to the God's clear revealed will, but when he was struggling, God blessed Sarah and Abraham's household for Sarah's sake, it says because of her obedience. That blows me away. And God chastened Abraham through hate, with the whole Hagar situation. In that whole, I mean, it's a deep thing that goes on. I get into that when I do premarital counseling. It's a really deep thing that happens there. So wives, if your husband gets off and you're obedient to the Lord, your husband's not like, oh, I get off. No, husband, you are in God's crosshairs and you're gonna be taken to the woodshed. You need to make sure you walk right with God, amen? It's important stuff. Very, very important. So, uh, Number one, uh, recognizing and submitting to the husband's headship. In, in, in Genesis 18, 6, because it says Sarah called Abraham Lord, and First Peter gives her as an example. Sometimes I share with people that when I was, my wife and I were first seeing each other, she said, I was just reading First Peter chapter 3 in her devo my devotional life. I'm like, great. She goes, yeah. You know, it says that Abraham, that Sarah called Abraham Lord. I'm like, yeah. And she goes, you want me to call you Lord? Of course, you want to be biblical, I said, you know. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I mean, I said, you don't have to call me Lord, baby, because we're not even married yet, right? And we got married, and then I said, where is it? No, no, I didn't do that. No, I didn't do that either. Her tongue was saying, you want me to call you Lord, but part of her mind was like, you know. But anyway, she's a good girl. But, uh, but I was blown away that that was her heart. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. I think I'm, I'm, this is the right gal, you know? Uh, so it was, it was pretty cool. But remember, Abraham told Sarah when a picture of the triune God comes there, you know, those three, you know, to just torch Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham said to Sarah, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes. <laughs> I can't see Sarah saying, do it yourself, Abraham. Get off your, you know, no, he's doing things. He has what God's called him to do. But she, you know what I'm saying? There was, there was a, she, she understood the leadership. There wasn't a bunch of quarreling and fighting. But there was times where they struggled. And I don't have time to get into that. But, you know, uh, there was times when they struggled. And then, and then they learned. And, and they learned to, not as Abraham's foot was on her, but that they were a team. And there was a time where God said to Abraham regarding Hagar and putting her out of the house because that the Lord said to Abraham, hearken unto the voice of your wife. Your wife has insight, and she's right in this. Amen? So a wise man will also, I'm sorry, the women are like, good, go after the men. He just totally lost track of what he's doing here. No. Uh, I know exactly where I'm at. But I think it's important that we understand the balance here, is that doesn't mean wives are to be uh, shut up. And, you know, we, they, we talk about how they're taken out of the man's side. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, amen. They're not taken out of the man's head to lead over him. They're not taken out of his feet uh, to be trampled underfoot. They're taken from his side and they're teammates, but there is a headship that the man has when he exercises that leadership. And it's important that we get that. Number two, respect your husband. Ephesians 5.33, we're in Ephesians 5, so look at verse 33. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, We'll get into that later when we get through the, the man's commandments. 
the, the husbands. And the wife must see to it that she, what? Respects her husband. Sisters, it's, it's imperative that you respect uh, your husband's position and that you see that God is the one who ordained marriage, amen? He's the one that made the two uh, one flesh. He instituted it. It's from him. And you need to respect your husband's position. But my husband is oftentimes not respectable. Well, think about this, you know. When I pull over to, if a cop pulls you over, right? I don't, you know, they'll come to your window. I don't go like, what do you want now, man? You're always picking on me, you know? I, I don't make it a personal thing with them. Well, there's bad cops. Yeah, there's bad everything in this world. There's, there's bad doctors, there's bad pastors, there's bad police officers, but there's also many people that seek to do what's right, amen? And he may not even be a good cop, but I'm respecting his position, amen? And by the way, it goes better for you. Can't tell you how many tickets I've got out by being good, being nice, you know? Honestly, I, there's a few times where it should have written me up, man. I'm just, you know, I don't try to make a habit of that, but in the past, I haven't been pulled over for a long time, but sometimes I got pulled over and I just was humble. And it was cool. I mean, sometimes it's just, I think, I don't know, Lord, sometimes it seems like it's the Lord because I was pulled over turning right on two different uh, stop, uh, lights where you can't turn right. It's coming out of the mall over there, and I never came that way because my wife asked me to go to, uh, she asked me to go Christmas shopping, <laughs> you know? My, yeah, I blamed it on the wife right there, right? <laughs> it's the woman thou it's given me, you know. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was coming right out of the T.O. Mall, and I didn't, I usually go on the freeway or, or take the back road, but I turned right to go to pharmacy for her, and I was, I'm, for her, no, I'm just kidding. And I turned right, and I didn't, and then I turned right again. And literally a cop pulls me over and he goes, did you know you just, you turned right on two reds that say no right? And I don't even look for that and see me. I mean, there's one now, I think, or maybe two. So I'm not used to that. And, and he pulls me over. I go, now at this point, you know, I'm going down the road and then he pulls me over and there's traffic going by. And I'm like, sorry, man. Didn't, I honestly didn't see him, but it's my fault, you know? And my wife's, he's like, what? No, I didn't say that, you know? I, I, I just owned it. I just, how much, it's my, it was my fault. What can I say? I go, yeah, I blew it. I'm so sorry, man. I didn't see him, but hey. And he was going to write me up. And I'm like 30, 40 feet from the red light in front of us. And somebody goes, <laughs> right through the red light. And he goes, did you see that? I go, yeah, go get him, you know. <laughs> now, I didn't say go get him. I just said, yeah, I saw that, you know. And he went and he goes, this is your lucky day. I said, no, I, I amended it. I said, no, it's my blessed day. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. But you know what? I respect his position. And sometimes I deserve the lumps, you know, so to speak, you know. And we need to respect the positions that God has given us. You know, God's given order in the church. Amen. He, and thank God there's order. Can you imagine if there was no order, there were no commands, no rules, no, you know, no direction. We'd have anarchy and destruction. That's why I say the difference between a a swamp and a beautiful river, deep and pure and beautiful and powerful, is a river has banks, it has boundaries, amen? A swamp is diseased typically and, you know, not the nicest place to visit. Um, anyway, respect your husband. Number three, have self-control. Titus 2.3 says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. So you're not supposed to be a gossip. Sisters, when you're tempted to say something about somebody because you're envious or you're hurt or you're covetous or whatever is going through your mind, don't say it. I love the prayer of the psalmist when he says, Lord, you know, he prays to put, you know, a guard over his mouth. I love the prayer where, of the psalmist when he says, you know, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing unto you. Amen? It starts with the heart. Out of the heart, Jesus says, the mouth speaks. And every idle word, Jesus says, will be brought into judgment. Watch out for gossip, man. It's a serious thing. Jesus talked about just one idle word will be brought up at judgment day. So you got to be loving. If you're a Christian, you're supposed to be loving toward others. Amen? You're supposed to care for others. You, you see someone that's struggling or not going, through, pray for them and love them, amen? Well, what if it's a situation that needs to be addressed? Then if you're called to be part of that addressing, the Bible says those who are, you know, 
it talks about those who are, you know, spiritual. And that's after he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love and peace and joy. A few verses earlier, in the Spirit, of, it says to restore someone with, in, in gentleness, in the Spirit of gentleness. Amen. So God wants to have a loving, gentle hearts to help each other out. We're Christians. Jesus died for us. We're brothers and sisters. We should love each other. Amen. And if you're struggling with gossip and, and, and malice and anger and things like that in your heart, you need to get on your knees and get right with God. There's something wrong with your relationship with God right there. Amen. And when you get right with God, the gossip thing will get cleaned up. Amen. Serious stuff, you guys. So he says, uh, so number three is having self-control. Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, meaning have a sense of dignity about you, sister. Amen? A sense of, you know, I fear God. That should be seen in your walk. We're talking about our walks with God today. Amen? Talking about how we walk with Jesus today. And your walk should be reverent toward God. There be a sense of dignity that, that you're a person that loves and fears the Lord. Same with the men, of course. Not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine. In those days, I've told you before, the wine is totally different today than then. Because it's fortified. You couldn't get it that much, that strong in those days. So don't think when you buy wine, that's what Jesus was drinking. And they often mix their wine with water. Okay? And that's why it says not too much wine. Now, you can go to the other extreme. No wine at all. If you even have a drop, it's sin. It's wicked because it was always just fresh grape juice wrong. I don't think he's saying not to drink too much grape juice here. That's what that would have to mean, right? That makes no sense either. Okay, so just be careful and don't allow yourself to be getting drunk on uh, have self-control. Number four, love your husbands. Love your husbands. I can't tell you how many times, just recently, I've seen in commentaries that husbands are called to love their wives, but wives are never commanded to love their husbands because it comes natural to them. Or then they'll say something like that. I'm like, what are you talking about? These are scholars, right? Commentaries. Because right here in Titus chapter 2, verse 4, it says, so that they may encourage the younger women to love their husbands. There it is. Women are called to love too. And yes, God has given us, we're creating his image, so we have a natural capacity to love. And Jesus says even the pagans love their own, right? But we're called to love in a different way than the pagans. Amen? We're called to have agape, supernatural divine love. And I'm talking about the, the agape of the Lord because agape can be used in different ways, but it's a sold out kind of love. And sisters, you're supposed to love your husbands. And we live in a day and age where love is growing cold, where even in the church, you know, there's unfaithfulness sometimes. I'm talking about churches, I'm, it's very rare that's happened here, but through the years I've been here, I've even seen it here, you know, and had to deal with it. And that's first uh, Proverbs chapter 2 warns about a woman breaking the covenant she made with the husband of her youth and how God takes that so seriously. And the Bible says you can receive in yourself, you know, those who sin sexually, sin against their own bodies, you know, serious stuff. We've got to make sure that we're right with God. And he's a forgiving God. So if in the past you went through some kind of struggle and you guys are restored, praise God. Walk in that and be thankful for your forgiveness and grow in Christ then, amen? It's important that we get it right. Number five, love your children. In chapter two, verse four of Titus, so that they may encourage young women to love their husbands and to what? Love their children. And, it's, and that's one of the things you would think, why do women need to be commanded to love their children? Don't women just automatically love their children? Yes, in many, most cases. In fact, there's nothing so beautiful and deep and profound to me uh, uh, I shouldn't say nothing because the cross is the most profound thing by far. But as far as a tangible thing that you see physically with your eyes in this world, then a mother's love for her children just blows me away. And I love my children enough to easily die for them, to tear up in my prayers for them and so forth. But I just love, you know, I see uh, my own daughters, you know, Holly with her kids. And now I'm seeing Heather with uh, her first child, you know. Uh, and uh, it's just, you know, little, little baby Russ, Russell, and, you know, both her parents, lo they love their, Adam and Heather love their child so much. And I've been able to see that with, with Holly. And I saw that in my own wife. I mean, my wife, it's her, you know, I'm like wondering. Because when Holly was born, it was our first kid. She's like holding it perfectly. Everything's fine, smooth. I'm like, does she have kids I don't know about? Because she's like done this before, it looks like. And I'm like all awkward, you know. You know, it's just like 18 thumbs or something. 19, somebody would say, you know. Or whatever. It's just like, what in the world? And it's just that it is there naturally. But guess what? The heart can get really hard 
in the world that we live in. And remember, the last days, people will be without what? Family love, it says. And love can grow cold. And that's why even the Lord, before that was stated, it warns in Isaiah 49, 15, it's also a promise. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, some may forget to love them. I will not forget you. Isn't that a great promise, though, too? He won't forget us. His love is greater than the love of a mother for her baby. <laughs> you fathers, Jesus said, know how to give good gifts to your children. If they ask you for a, a piece of bread or a fish, you don't give them a scorpion or a serpent, right? How much more, since you guys were evil, you know how to do give good gifts. Even though you're evil, he says to his own disciples, how much more will your heavenly father give you good gifts? Another place says, give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Wow. God the Father's love toward you is greater than the love of a father toward his children and love greater than the love of a mother toward her babies. That's powerful. If you're like, what can I be thankful? Joe said we're supposed to rejoice and bring not just salt to our meal, our lunch, but to bring love and, and rejoice. What can I rejoice over? That God's love that is profound and beautiful as parental love is toward children. God, that's just a dim picture of God's great love toward you. So great is his love that he gave his son to be slaughtered in your place. Focus on that love when you're going through hard times. Amen. Say, wow, let me not betray such love because I'm going through things or whatever. Amen. Help me to be grateful and be thankful. And we live in a day where I can tell you right now that there's millions of women and men that don't love their children because we have about 60 million plus abortions in our country. That's little babies in the womb being slaughtered. That's the Holocaust of Jews times 10 in our country. And we act like we're such a righteous country. That's why there's, and there's a lot of people that, that's why there's this whole Supreme Court thing over Kavanaugh right now. People want to make sure we still have the right to murder babies. In fact, you know what? I just read a headline a few days ago, August 11th, Washington Times. I just read this recently, but it came out August 11th, just a few days back. Uh, Chelsea Clinton argued Thursday that it would be unchristian to roll back abortion rights for women. During an interview with Sirius XM's Signal Boost, the former first daughter and by the way, she looks to have political aspirations, said it would be unconscionable for America to return to the pre-Roe versus Wade era when abortion was illegal. Like, that's unconscionable to me, she added. And also, I'm sure that it will unleash another wave of hate in my direction, but as a deeply religious person, it is also unchristian to me. What in the world? It's unchristian to be pro-life and not want to see babies slaughtered. They'll call good evil and evil good. I think that's happening right there, amen? What about, you know, oh, is it Jeremiah 1.5? I knew you in your mother's womb before you were born, amen? She wants to talk about the Bible. Let's quote the scripture, amen? And the Bible warns against killing and murder. And these are the most vulnerable people amongst us. Remember when the whole thing was happening when parents, or illegal aliens were coming in and they were putting the parents in prison and people were getting upset because they were being separated from their kids and all the liberals were yelling and screaming, right? And I'm not even getting into that issue, you know, because my, my sympathies were there too as far as for people being separated. It's a very sad situation. But guess what? Where are the liberals when it's not just being separated from kids, but it's murdering the kids? Where's, there's a huge elephant in the room, you know, and we act like everything's, I'm sorry. If you believe it's okay to murder kids, I can't hear your view on anything else after that. I'm sorry. If you believe it's okay to murder babies in the womb, I can't hear you on any kind of morality after that. We have to get back to the, is it okay, you know, that issue. Because if you believe it's okay to, to put Jews in an oven and, and, and kill them and, and, you know, and you think it's fine, then how can I listen to you on other issues? Same with abortion. And to me, it's heartbreaking. So women, wives need to be told to love their husbands. And they need to be taught to also to love their children. This is, a huge, this is a huge problem, and I bring it up from time to time because I'm not gonna be one of those pastors that ignores the very important things that are happening right now in our culture, amen? We're supposed to be rescue those who are being taken to the slaughter, the Bible says, amen? Remember that P2411 shirt? We're gonna bring that back out again. 
with a, I had a guy drop a, you know, basically a skeletal person behind, locked in that needs to be set free, you know, at a, you know, because we're after the dead, the zombies out there, amen, rescuing people that are dead and need Jesus. And many are going to the slaughter, and many are bringing their kids to the slaughter. And the heartbreaking thing is, the world's deceived many women to make them think that the baby isn't a baby. But now with ultras, you know what I'm saying? So a lot of women killed their babies not knowing they were killing their babies. And there's forgiveness and mercy if you've come to Jesus after something like that. You've come to the cross and you've, and, and you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. If you haven't, you need to. Otherwise, you'll be haunted. You'll be haunted by it until you're right with Jesus in that area. If you've committed abortion, you need to, you need to come to realize Jesus paid for just like, he paid for everything, sin, but he paid for that sin too, Amen. You ask the Lord for forgiveness and mercy, and you'll be forgiven. But you have to have a repentant heart where you have to have a heart where you wouldn't do it again, you know? That's a truly repentant heart, and you recognize that it's sin. And the husbands or men, if you've encouraged one in abortion, you're just as liable as, as the woman that got the abortion. And even more so if you're the one that pushed her to do it and talked her into it. And you need to repent before Jesus. Amen? So right now, Chelsea Clinton is saying that if we try, if we oppose killing babies, that we're not Christians. She's the true Christian. By the way, let's not forget when the WikiLeaks came out, there was a WikiLeak to the Podesta brothers from Abramovich to her good friend Podesta, who's the brother of John Podesta, who's headed up Hillary's campaign, right? When she ran against Trump. And the WikiLeaks showed that Abramovich, an occultist, was inviting him to a spirit cooking dinner. And we show in our video on spirit cooking, if you go to goodfight.org and you type in spirit cooking, you'll see our spirit cooking video where we show Abramovich showing her recipe for spirit cooking. Urine, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, disgusting things. And she takes blood. She said it was pig's blood, though. And she puts an effigy of a little baby or boy and throws the blood on it against the wall. And you've got 666 written everywhere. And she's a follower of Crowley's teachings, and we show that his spirit cooking called Cakes of Light was all about making mock communion wafers for Satanists that they were supposed to take every day. And when I looked at you show his recipe, and she uses a lot of his recipe, it includes the blood of a child. And he's invited, the Podesta brothers are both invited, to come to my spirit cooking dinner at my house. And she doesn't have to explain what it is, because it seems like they know what it is. She just invites them. Hey, is your brother, bring your brother along to my spirit cooking and we show her on the video doing the spirit. You're, are you saying that people in the highest realms of politics are involved in Satanism? No doubt about it. Okay. Well, how much does Hillary know about Abramovich? Well, she was invited to her whole, you know, first thing and stuff. And how much is Hillary involved in all that? I don't know. How much did John know? I mean, his brother's invited him and she says, bring your brother. I don't know exactly. I don't try to fill in the blanks when I don't see exactly what they are because I'm very careful and precise in what I say. But I do know there's a lot of red flags there, guys. And when you're doing that kind of thing, I mean, you, you know, that's abhorrent in God's eyes. And there's all kinds of wickedness that you would be just disgusted by, by not just people in the music industry and everything else. There's Satanists that have risen to power in politics. It's all around you right now. Trust in Jesus, amen. Wives, love your children. Love them deeply. Spend time with them, Amen. Time is huge. Don't get all caught up in social media where you're all into yourself and everything revolves around you and you forget about your kids and they're growing up not learning about Jesus. Educate your children in Jesus, amen? Teach them about the Lord. Make sure your house is a Christ-centered house. Make sure that you are an example to them, amen? And I'm gonna get into child training, which I don't wanna do because I'm gonna do a little series on that. So I don't wanna spend too much on that. That's coming up, but stay tuned, amen? We're gonna be getting into that because it's so important in this day and age. Because the children need time, they need to be taught, they need to be disciplined, biblically, lovingly, in an encouraging way. Number six, wives need to have purity of life, purity of life and doctrine. And Titus 2.6 says, they're to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. So God wants women to be pure, be careful, you know. Don't be watching stupid movies like the uh, was it Shades of Grey. Disgusting, man. How can you be a Christian and watch pornography? That's pornography for women. 
Chad wrote, I think, what, two articles on that? Three articles now. Be careful, bro. You just put up, somebody would say you put up the 666 by doing that, bro. I know, some people take it way too far. Somebody said, I flashed 666. I'm like, what? Yeah. I, I'm holding the, I guess I'll try to hold the, the bread like this or this, you know. Now, if I'm going like this around my eye and stuff, you know, and doing it on purpose, yeah. But if I'm holding the communion thing in there, it's not intended to be 666, okay? It's the only way I can hold it. I can hold it with three fingers. I don't need to, you know. And Chad goes three. I'm like, oh, don't do that. Somebody will say you're worshiping the devil, you know. Uh, anyway, you guys, gals, watch where you sink your hearts. Watch where you put your eyes, amen? Be pure. Number seven. Number seven. Commandment number seven for women. Thou shalt not nag your husband to death. Okay? Proverbs 29, 15. It's better to live in a desert land than with a contentious and vexing woman. That shows me that women can be contentious and vexing at times. Don't be that woman. You, but, but, I've been through this. I've been, you know, bring it before the Lord. Kneel before him and say, Lord, I give you my, my anxieties. I give my, doesn't mean you don't talk to your husband. Sarah talked to her husband about Hagar, that situation. And man, don't say when your wife brings something up after this message that she wants to talk about because it's a bill that needs to be paid that's not getting paid or it's something that's going on with the kids. Didn't you hear? You're not supposed to nag me. That's not what I'm talking about. Don't twist this either to mean you need to talk about important issues as a, as a, as a husband and wife, amen? Now, sometimes the husband's really tired stressed, you know, and needs a, a, a few minutes or whatever. But husband, you need to make sure you don't sweep things under the bed, under the, under the bed either. Amen. I mean, I know I've, I got calls from the past from a certain brother. He's here right now. He knows I love him. And every time I'd hear him on the phone, his wife is yelling at him in the background. She has nothing to do with our conversation or why he's calling me. He's not even calling to complain about her. And I'm like, oh Lord God, I want to give my wife a big kiss. Wow. And he's laughing really hard right now. He knows who he is. His wife doesn't go here, so I'm safe. If she, you're listening to this message by live stream, we love you. Repent. Okay? You can't just keep doing that. You know, we love you. I don't think she's listening, but we need to make sure. You know, it says in Proverbs 27, 15, a constant dripping on a day of steady rain and a contentious women are alike. You know, you type in dripping Chinese torture. It's a form of torture. You know? And it's better for worse. Yes, I remind the husband for better. If you want to get tortured, but you need to endure it in Jesus. Number eight, don't deprive him sexually. The husband must fulfill, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3 through 5. The husband must fulfill the duty to his wife. So this goes for the husband and the wife. A lot of times men just think of their own wants and desires sexually, but the woman has wants and desires too. And the husband must fulfill the duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time. So don't deprive each other of your sexual relationship, except for agreement. That means both parties agree for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. So you want to Sometimes it's like, hey, we're going to fast not just from food, but we're going to not have sexual relations for a little bit just to seek God and deal with a crisis in the family or a crisis in the church or a crisis in, the mission, uh, in some country or the state or a vote coming up or whatever. And come together again so Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Wives, by depriving your husband of a sexual relationship, you're setting him up for a fall. That does not give a husband the right to fall. Because men are supposed to be pure even when they're single, amen? And they don't have a wife, amen? So husbands don't ever, ever use that as an excuse. But wives, you'll be held somewhat culpable too if you're being self-centered and don't want to have relations with your husband and put him in a position to where he struggles more so than he would. It's important stuff, you guys. A true story, an astronaut, and I don't, it's not in my notes, I wasn't going to bring it up, but uh, uh, one of the early astronauts hit the, hit the, uh, they hit, hit, a ball was hit when they were playing baseball on the street and the ball rolled below a window. And they were arguing about sex. And she was depriving her husband. 
And she said, you won't have sex with me until, and she mentioned this astronaut's name, and it's not in my notes, I was going to put it here, so I'm trying to remember which one it was. He says, you won't have sex with me until that boy next door, and says his name, steps on the moon. And you know, when he went onto the moon, he stepped on the moon, he said, congratulations, Mr. So-and-so to that guy. <laughs> no kidding. True story. You know? That's pretty crazy, isn't it? Nine, make sure that you recognize that you are his helpmate, that God created husband and wife. A lot of times I tell people when they're getting married, premarital counseling, it's not all about you. You don't get married to this person so you can get this person as your trophy and what you can get out of them and everything else. And I say, that's like a parasite. What does a parasite do to its host? It just wants the host so it can get blood out of it, right? It isn't interested in benefiting the host at all. And that's how people approach marriage. What can I get out of this person? And if I stop getting out of this person, I want nothing to do with them anymore. That is so selfish and un, that's unchristian. Amen? You marry someone, you're supposed to love them. Amen? And seek their benefit and their well-being. Amen? And the Bible says that God gave Adam a helpmate. Amen? And again, out of his side, not out of his feet. He would lead, but they would be a team. I praise God. My wife and I are, are such a, a, a team together. And I hear her talking to women all the time, when, and even time in counseling, she'll say, my husband's always made me feel like a teammate. Whenever we go on missions, or whenever we go, he's always tried to include me. And, and it's not that I just think that she's being an awesome teammate and everything else. That's all true. I also recognize that I'm very limited. I can only do so many things. And she has gifts that I don't have that enhance my gifts and that God creates us this way to be teammates. And she blows me away. I'm absolutely blown away by my wife, still to this day, you know? And, uh, and I'm not saying this because I'm one of those guys that's deprived and say some nice things to my wife, and maybe I'll be able to have a relationship, you know? You, we have a really beautiful relationship. We have a close relationship, and we have joy. We laugh together. We, we joke together. We play together. We work together. We cry together at times. And we're not perfect. We're far from perfect. But you know what we keep doing? putting our foot forward and obeying the law of Christ regarding marriage and it makes our marriage work out. That's it. That's the key. It's not because we're anything. It's because he's everything and he's given us the God you factors handbook. Amen. If you just obey his word, it, it works out. Amen. Number 10. Well, cultivate a humble heart before God. Cultivate a humble heart before God and your husband. 1 Peter 3, 3 through 6 says, Your dormant must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. I love that. That blows me away. In other words, God looks at it. That blows me away. God's seen women that are humble and their hearts are right with him and they seek him and fear him and, he, and it's precious to him. He looks at it and it's precious to him. It blows me away. It's like, Wow. A woman can have a disposition, an attitude that causes God's heart to just marvel that it's precious. That, that blows me away. I'm like, what a great position to be in as a sister, which is precious instead of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, be submissive to their own husbands. And some of you men are like, wow, this is an amazing message. Because I'm looking at the clock, and he never got to ark my commandments. I am not preaching this at the camp next week, the 10 for the men, because there'll be men that I'm sure will be missing. And they'll be like, Whew. you should be like, I want to see what God has for me. Amen? That needs to be your attitude. Amen? And every man here needs to make sure he needs more part two of this message. Amen? The 10 commandments for men. Ooh, yeah, two sisters. It gives me more time to work on it too. So praise the Lord. Amen? God is good. Amen? I thought I'd get through all 20 of them, but hey. 10 and 10, but we're not going to do that. Yeah, sister over here is like shaking her head now. But hey, you know what? Uh, we want, you know, quality and quantity, but quality above quantity. And we have enough time to do communion and get out on time or early. So could we all please stand as they pass out the communion cup? Sisters, the Bible has a lot to say about marriage, doesn't it? Amen. And there's a lot more than that, but those are a lot of the basics that you just walk in the truth, man. And 
you'll be blessed. We're going to pass out the cup and the bread. And I praise God for this kind of message because we have a lot of couples, new couples that have been married recently that have done a lot of premarital counseling in the last year or two. Uh, several couples have been married recently. So, uh, And if you're not even married, this stuff is so good. Why? Because it applies to your own walk with God in a lot of ways, doesn't it? Seeking the Lord, growing in Him. Lord is good. Amen. Yeah. That's what I was thinking, but I heard a lot of people went like this. It's in, he's saying it's in two weekends. Two weekends. So it is two weekends. Okay, I, okay, well, it is two weekends. Okay, praise God. Man, be here next Sunday. Amen. <laughs> Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nations sing it louder. Cause nothing has the power to say but your name. Jesus, in your name we pray. Come and fill our hearts today. Lord, give us strength to live for you and glorify your name. Cause your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder cause nothing has the power to say your name is a strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter like no your name let the nation sing it louder cause nothing has the power to say but your name praise the lord brothers and sisters i'd be remiss if i left here this morning without encouraging you sisters in this regard as well and I know you know, so I don't have to say it all the time. But Jesus said, apart from me, you could do what? All these commands that are given to be this, you know, godly, wonderful woman. I mean, it gets tougher if you read Proverbs 31, right? It's like, whoa, look at this, you know? That's the ideal. Just like Jesus is the ideal, right? For men, right? Uh, I'd be remiss, though, if I didn't encourage you that that's in Ephesians 5 where it talks about the woman's and the, man, the man's role in marriage right before that he says don't be drunk with wine which leads to dissipation or debauchery or lasciviousness or license but be what filled with the holy spirit amen you can't do these things in your own strength apart from me you can do nothing jesus said paul said through him we could do what all things he needs to be the strength of your life if you go out you say i need to do all these things and be a better wife and i'm just gonna grit my teeth and do it you're gonna be just burnt out and exhausted and frustrated amen but if you say lord where you guide you what provide he enables us by the power of his spirit to accomplish that which he calls us to amen so you must rely on the lord in prayer and say god be the strength of my life give me strength fill me with your spirit to accomplish your will through the struggle of obeying your word. And he'll give you the strength. And pray for wisdom too, amen? And pray that he'd guard your tongue. And pray that he'd help you be gentle and forgiving and merciful. The Lord's forgiven you. We're supposed to forgive one another as he's forgiven us, amen? And I know husbands, I'm a husband. I know husbands need forgiveness at times, amen? We tend to, you know, uh, uh, fall short. Uh, every, every man, every woman does. So we need God's grace. Walk in grace, sisters. 
Look at the blood that's been shed for you and, and look at your husband. He's under that same blood, amen? You want to apply that to him. Walk in love. The fruit of the Spirit is love and peace and joy, amen? Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness. All those things you need to have in abundance to have a blessed and successful marriage. So you need to be filled with the Spirit. And Ephesians 6, right after that, he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day against the wiles of the devil's am devil, amen? So we're in a spiritual battle and the enemy's gonna throw darts in your head and try to get you off and ruin your life and, and cause you to go up in flames. Put on the armor of God, sisters, amen? And brothers too. Brothers, don't say, oh, I'm gonna wait till next week to be the husband I'm called to be. No, you know you're supposed to be loving your wife right now, amen? You know you're supposed to be denying yourself right now. You know that you're supposed to be a, ser a servant leader right now and be a blessing to her. You're, it's like, oh yeah, but my wife's supposed to serve me. You're supposed to serve her too. Jesus, Jesus is a picture of the man, right? He's a picture of what we're supposed to be. And he says, I didn't come to be served, but to what? To serve and give his life a ransom for many. Uh-oh, here I go on the men. I'm just encouraging you, man. I love you guys. Serve your wives too. You want to make a little list and see who does what the most for each other. Amen? Mostly it's usually to be the wife. Men, you need to try to win that battle and serve them more than they serve you. Or at least aim for, you know, a lot more service. Amen? Father God, we thank you that we're not saved through our own service, Father. For Jesus not only said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. He went on to say, and give my life a ransom for many. Father, we thank you that he gave his life a ransom for the many the great multitudes uh the every nation people and tongue father that he tasted death your word says for everyone we thank you for the bread which represents his body we thank you for the cup which represents his blood that was given for us we pray father in your son's 